This is our second go of it. I am Lisa Malosa. I'm at the University of South Florida, and I'm going to try to get us, keep us on task, haha, <laughs> and facilitate our conversation today. Thank you, Mike Trice, for setting up our room and recording it. And so keep in mind that our conversation is recorded, and there's no, you know, secret surveillance about that, except to offer it back to the community. Um, all our great ideas and suggestions. Our topic today is loosely based on classroom activities and exercises um, to get at how can we engage our students better. And we're all sort of teaching in and around the big topic of technical and professional communication. And so when we share an idea, if you can sort of frame it in a way that could potentially be useful in our, from anything from our service course to maybe a more specialized kind of a course, if you could. And with that said, I'm just going to open it up and ask uh, Lauren Cagle, also known as Cagle, to please uh, get us started with one of her favorite exercises. And when you're not talking, if you could mute or make sure that you are in a super quiet place, then you don't have to. But the muting also helps with any background noise. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, perfect. I did the calling in on the phone thing and just wanted to make sure. Um, I was thinking about what to talk about today, and um, I uh, wanted to say two things about classroom engagement um, and activities. One sort of big picture, I, uh, a couple of years ago, um, shifted to a model where I require students to bring some kind of um, device that they can access Canvas with. That's our LMS here, and it was at USF when I was there. Um, and so I always have them do something in class, some kind of free write or um, like small group activity where then they're submitting something. And I found that can be a really um, useful uh, tool that students just kind of get in the habit of, okay, I'm just going to go into Canvas and open this and then I know I have to be engaged and I have to write something, I have to whatever. Um, and then the specific activity that I did this semester already, um, I did it as a first day intro for an introduction to tech writing class which is mostly engineers, but I also have some neuroscientists, so it's an interesting, and sometimes I have equine science students also. Um, and uh, I tried something new that I really liked. I had them uh, in their groups, like just three or four students, just list every kind of writing they could think of. Like they have no instruction so far, I haven't taught them about genre, like any of that. I just said every type of writing, and if it helps sort of think through your day, right? I woke up this morning and the first thing I looked at was a text message and then I read some Facebook posts and then I looked at a newspaper article and then, right, and going throughout your day. And then had them put these lists on the board and when it was all done, we had about, I think, 120 types on the board from a class of 23 students. Um, and then I gave them the definition of technical writing from Tech World's website. Tech World has a great page that's like, what is technical writing, what is a technical writer? So I gave them that definition to read, and then based on that definition, asked them to please identify everything from their list that they considered technical writing. Um, and that was a really useful activity for them just to kind of get some sense of like, what, what am I doing in this class when we say technical writing, what do we mean? But I could totally see taking that, the frame of that activity, right, a, a definitional activity, and using it for a lot of different classes. And then also even within a tech writing class, shifting that throughout the semester. So I might even do it again this semester and ask them, okay, based on the work that we've done so far, has anything shifted, right? Do you now think, say, recipes are technical writing, whereas you didn't before? So that was the activity I wanted to share. I lost, my, I lost all my screens. I love that activity, Kegel. And I... I really love this idea that it is flexible, that you can reuse it at different points in the term mm -hmm. as students' uh, definitions of what writing is and what technical writing is changes. And mm -hmm. that's such a great educational and learning outcome sort of thing is to revisit the things that you've already done and it just kind of keeps underscoring. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Thanks. Yeah, Ms. Sarah? Go ahead. All right. So one thing that I do with my students is pretty simple. Every day I have them introduce themselves and answer just a simple question like, what's the best thing you're working on right now? Or what's your favorite color? And that prepares mm -hmm. them to get up and talk in front of the class, not only in discussion, but also when we are doing presentations later in the semester. So we'll do that pretty consistently through midterms. And then it kind of drops off once we're getting into 
different parts of the class when they know each other better. Can I ask a question? Yeah. How long does that usually take and sort of what size classes are you working with? I'm working with students in a business communication course in groups of 25 per section. Okay. Um, and then around spring break, it starts to trickle off when we just get started because we all know each other's names. Mm -hmm. So thanks for the question. Yeah, I think in larger classes, you could probably do the same sort of thing just in small. It would have to be grouped up, but you could still do the same sort of thing. So instead of all in one class, you could break them into units of seven to ten, and then they can do it within internally. So that might work. Mm -hmm. Because I know that it wasn't that what you were getting at. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> um, so I think that's kind of the cool thing too is when we think through exercises how they can be ported to different types of classes and sizes of classes. You know, as we get more and more pressure to get butts in the seats, um, our our dream of those 15 to 22, 15 to 20 students is it's harder to do. And so it, the notion of finding different ways of engagement and exercises and activities becomes so much more important. Hey, Mike, you got something to share? Sure, yeah, actually, just sort of piggybacking off that. I mean, one of the things that, um, that um, I like to do, particularly in those larger classes, and we're looking at 25 to, to, to 30 students in some cases, not necessarily a mammoth course. I mean, I've had, I remember some years back at UT with 100, 150 students, uh, nothing like that. But um, with the closer 25 to 30, being able to, to find activities that group students um, works well. So one of the things that, and I kind of like callback activities. So one of the things that we do when we're working with um, teaching consensus um, to our engineers for the first time is get them, this is going to sound really juvenile to begin with, uh, but get them into groups of three or four and ask them, you know, to decide on what their favorite snack is. And we just give them a few minutes to, to talk through that and we sit on it. Um, then we, you know, we layer in some of the instruction from there, uh, walking through dialectic consensus and, and, and stasis theory and some of those elements. And we sort of come back and we ask them, you know, how did you decide um, about the snack? You know, what is a snack? So sort of building up the definitions of, you know, how did you define what the snack was? Does, your, does everyone's snack actually, you know, fit this definition? How can you justify that? And working them through these justification reasons as a call back to that initial sort of group activity. And then we get a little bit of debate and play back and forth between the groups on, um, you know, whether they agree or disagree in the different category areas. Huh. I like it. And it's to, that's also something that's portable across different courses within a technical and professional communication curriculum and, and kind of forces us as instructors to really keep things moving forward. Not, that's always tough. Yeah. Oh, is that Barb? <laughs> oh, I see her face. She's so lovely. I think this is my favorite part. It's just to see who drops <laughs> into <laughs> faculty <laughs> office hours. <laughs> Always the best part of office hours is seeing who drops by. Exactly. <laughs> that should be our new slogan. <laughs> Just drop on by. <laughs> you know, I, what was so exciting about this topic for me this week is for the very first time in my career, I'm actually teaching teachers how to teach and how to teach technical and professional communication. And I've always known intuitively that exercises and activities that you do in the classroom, that stuff that is so hidden from everybody that we don't ever really talk about except when we get together like this, is so important. And then when you're trying to explain to students what's different in teaching technical and professional communication than other kinds of writing, particularly like freshman composition, that it just becomes the activities become so even more important. And I've really had kind of like this, uh, I don't know, thing of conscious. It's like, what the hell do you actually, how do you teach them how to teach? And how do you teach them how to build these sorts of things? And so this is why I was so glad that we were doing this this week. And so now I'm going to turn it over to our other, other folks who are here. Like, Carol, do you have like a, a great activity you want to share with us? Well, I've been 
I've got one that that I hope is is useful. I think it's worked really well for me. So I use it in the introduction class, the service course, mm -hmm. and it's the first time they turn in a major document. Um, I just, you know, it's due, and they have to bring a hard copy to class. And then um, I start talking to them about what the evaluation is going to be. They have a rubric, but they're not looking at it. They're not paying any attention to it. So I ask them to collectively make the rubric. And I actually stand up at the board, and, um, you know, they start off, and it's what's so interesting to me about it is that because it's technical professional writing and not freshman comp, they really don't know what the difference is. And so collectively, they'll start out saying things like, well, just getting it done, that should be like 20%. And then, you know, no. for this. And, but anyway, by the time it all comes to pass, it takes about half an hour or so. But the students have decided what they should be graded on. And I have them looking at the assignment to see, well, where is that in the assignment? How, why should it? Anyway, long story short, what winds up happening is they start begging to take the assignments back and can we have one more day, one more day? And it's the same thing I would have told them anyway, but they listen better. So that's one of my favorite things to do. It's a great idea the, because it gives them that opportunity to, to co-create and have more of an investment. And that is so portable and flexible to anything. You can do it with any assignment mm -hmm, that's true. in any type of course. Wow, that's a really good one. I've done that, but it's been years. I've got a question, Carol. Um, yeah. Do do they are they looking at the rubric when they're coming up with one? And if not, does the rubric that they come up with match the, your original one at all? And then Excellent finally, question. which rubric do you end up grading them with? Okay, so the one that I attach to the assignment is very very general. So it'd be just enough to get them kind of understanding that, you know, we have to think about format, we have to think about content, I have to think about grammar. And then the one that they, I have them pull out the assignment sheet itself and start looking for, you know, what are the things you were asked to do? What are the learning outcomes? Where are you showing that you've actually integrated, you know, this idea with that idea? Or where have you, where are you showing your audience awareness? And so then they, they look at the assignment and then they write their, the rubric and I just kind of keep track on the board. And because I'm holding the marker, <laughs> I can make it say what I need it to say anyway, but they're, yep. they're right on track. <laughs> they're right okay. on track. And then they have the yeah. buy-in. Yeah. 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 I like that. Okay. But you didn't answer Rick's last question. Oh, Which I one do you one. grade with? The one that they create because it's, I've held the, the marker and I've made sure that it's still, <laughs> And it, it looks, matches kind of yours. It has more depth than the one I provided at the outcome, at the outstart. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So. Okay, so if, if everybody doesn't know Rick Mott, welcome, welcome, Rick. And I just want to say, dude, you always look so perfect. And today is no exception. And so it's not just conference way. That is like who you are. And I'm kind of feeling a little shabby sitting in my office. You're too kind. I'm... I'm in a t-shirt and a big heavy sweater. But, but it looks so stylish. And I know that has nothing at all to do with what we're talking well, about. He has too, though, that lovely city background he has. That's right, yes. Yeah, that was a great, great suggestion, Carol. And wonderful follow-up questions, Rick. So I'll, um, I don't want to – I'll speak up now if there are no more questions for Carol. I'm good. Um, you know, this was something I was trying to think of. I'm here because I want to learn new ideas, and I've already learned a couple, so I'm very happy. Um, and I was trying to think of, of assignments that I haven't been handing out or giving out for years and years. Uh, and there was one I spoke, at, spoke about at CPTSC um, this fall, and I've done it once in class, and I'm going to do it again this semester. And I told the students about it last week. And it's literally sending them out to other classes on our um, give a five minute recruitment presentation um, for our new certificate in technical and professional writing. So they need to, um, you know, we as a class, we discuss what the um, objective is. Um, of course, we discuss audience and then um, I, I pair them up. They need to put together a uh, 
Prezi or a Google Slides or some sort. Actually, I'm a big advocate of Google Slides now just because it's so easily accessible. Um, and they they put together a slide presentation, um, and then their first run through of that presentation is in our class, and we give them. And I don't grade them on well. I don't formally grade them on that presentation because it's the practice presentation, and we give them um, supportive feedback on on what was good and what could be different, and if the students are going to actually listen, uh, or if they if if it's got the information that they're going to be interested in, um, and then they are scheduled to go um, as a pair. They go visit four different classes on campus um, to give that recruitment presentation. Um, and, you know, I've kind of struggled with if it's ethical to send them out in a um, in that way. And um, what I've and, you know, if somebody tells me to stop, of course, I will. But the reason that I've been able to justify it pretty easily in my mind is because all of the activities that they are participating in in this assignment are things that they're going to do as technical writers. Um, it's organizing information, it's um, understanding who your audience is, and it's putting together a presentation and then standing up in front of a group of strangers instead of, you know, and as we all know, they all have to give presentations. But by the time they give presentations in our classes, we all know each other pretty well. So this gives them an opportunity to present to a, um, a really uh, an audience that they just do not yet know. So I'd be curious to hear other people's um, reaction to that in terms of ethics, if it's something that um, uh, I can see Lisa uh, has a look of. of I'm, I'm thinking it's, no, no, I'm thinking it through because, of course, ethics is a big thing. Right, it, huge, and where you situate yourself, and situational ethics, which this is definitely a situational ethic, and it's matching some of your course goals, but it's also doing some of these things that I think we all feel queasy about that we're being forced to do, and that is really, really market. You okay. know, we used to. 20 years ago, although I've not been in higher education this long, students were just there, they came in, but it's now it just seems like there's this almost co consistent, you have to market to make sure that your programs, your courses make and your programs have students and every department in a college of arts and sciences wants more majors because that impacts how arts and sciences is blah, blah. So um, the look on my face was that's a pretty good idea. But then when you brought up ethics, it's like, hmm, what is the ethical line? Um, yeah, I wonder if there's a need to provide an option there where they could they could take they could take the the certificate as an option in in the speeches they can make, where they could do a, a student one of the student services as well, which would give them the opportunity to research the student service and then make that presentation as well, which would seem to fill the same need. Um, I guess the I mean it becomes a little bit more of an issue because you're not getting as much marketing out there, but at least you're giving you're giving an option. You're putting it the certificate along with the selection of a of a of a, of a different sort of service um, component. I, and I didn't quite understand, Michael. What was the what was the option besides the marketing? Having them look into into some um, campus student services um, that they could that they would also that they could potentially give talks. Oh, I got gotcha. well. Yeah, yeah. So more of a general informational. Here's what. Option, or here's right, you know, so like go to find out what student health services are on campus and then give a presentation on that. If you're feeling overwhelmed, are you having food insecurity problems? Do you, you know, where can you go to get like emergency help if all of a sudden you find yourself basically homeless? You know, that sort of thing. They could do that if they felt there was a problem with um, yeah. the marketing of the program. What I like about that idea is it is innovative and it's trying to solve these problems we as administrators and faculty have in our programs. Those problems aren't going away. You know, this, I think this is one of the reasons Kegel is teaching a course that's got 70 or 75 students in it. It's because it's a marketing tool for their major. And, and there, what is the difference between offering a 70 or 75 person course compared to what you're doing? I don't know. <laughs> But that's a, it's a great assignment. 
Um, and I like your suggestion, Michael, to give them because even when I when I brought it up last week in class and we discussed it, I'm always I'm a little queasy because I'm thinking, okay, they didn't sign up for the class to go do recruitment for the program. Um, so I like having giving them the option of of talking about student services. Yeah, and I imagine that you're still going to get a fair number that would do the certificate just because you're you're an easy interview so the research is naturally going to gravitate them towards talking about the certificate um, but it does give a little bit of an option for those who who, who may have concerns mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know on my campus the concern for me would not be the students it would be the other departments. ah yes uh, i'm glad you brought that up right to us using students to recruit for our program but I will say we have an introductory course to our major, and that's a perfect assignment for them. Yeah. To go to the freshman comp classes and do a little pitch about our major. Yeah. And go ahead. Please Barry. go. No, I would interrupt. Keep you. going. Keep going, no, Barb. I was just going to say, like those the intro people, um, they're there because they want to be professional and technical writers, so it makes sense to have them go out and pitch this. And it also has the benefit of them researching some more of the field that they they want to go in. And this is, uh, they do this in an advanced class in professional and technical writing. So um, they are, they have bought into the, to the um, certificate. Yeah, but what I, I love about this little conversation the two of you are having is that it would work in both. And to figure out ways to, to do it, to do things in, across the curriculum and even come back to it later. That's fabulous. And, and it was, I came up with this absolutely as a, um, I had to come up with something because I used to teach at a school with 1,700 students and it was easy for a couple of us to visit every Mm -hmm. freshman composition class and now I'm at a school with 15,000 people and there's no way that mm -mm. Um, a couple of us can visit even some small percentage of the classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm question. chuckling. Um, have you considered asking students to make videos to help advertise or recruit the technical communication oh, nice. That might have uh, some of the advantages of not doing as much um, or maybe not having as much pressure to go into somebody else's courses if that becomes an issue. I, I like that idea, um, and I have not implemented that yet. Um, and you're talking about it as uh, create a video as a, an alternative to going to visit the class. As an alternative or as a both and, um, okay. different constraints and affordances of the medium. But Yeah. Um, and we haven't encountered any pushback from the faculty in terms of visiting class. People are usually very gracious about it. Um, but hey, I you know I'm not saying that they wouldn't push back at some point. Um, and I really like the idea of having the video because then there's a product that is available for later on if it's well done. Yeah, it's archived and you can like put it on as both a, here's what the students can do, but then, oh, look, if you actually read it, this is what we do. That's a good idea. You can also use them in online courses. Yes. During videos. Mm -hmm. Because that's one of the mm -hmm. things that we have problems with because our online classes get left out of stuff mm. because they're sort of, you know, the teachers are often distance teachers and not always on people's radar. So it would be handy to have a um, database, for lack of a better word, of promotional videos or things like that to offer to mm -hmm. teachers. And also, um, if I may, videos offer an opportunity that face-to-face -face does uh, differently, which is to, to talk about accessibility as a tech comm issue, mm -hmm. right? So if these videos have to be captioned and a transcript provided and so on, then that's a really good fit with uh, a unit on accessibility as well. Yep. I like that. Yeah, I'm glad Barbara, you brought up online because this notion of activities and exercises gets really complicated in the online environment. And mm -hmm. I think all of us have taught online 
or will be asked yeah. to teach online. <laughs> Never forget Laura Palmer saying that at one of the uh, grad student workshops at ATTW, like what's your best advice for, for the students going on the job market? She said it's not going to be if you teach online, it's going to be when. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, the engagement in an online class, I still struggle with. Totally. One, if I, on the online class, if I may, um, I worked with uh, MIT at USF on campus when I was developing the um, master's, a master's course on sustainability um, with Carl Herndl. And so we were working with the professionals who like make the fancy videos that, that have chapter headings and things like that. And, um, and in conversation with them um, and doing a little bit of just outside research, I ended up finding a, a method that I really like, um, and this is how I run online classes, is I split everything into weeks, which is not groundbreaking, right? So students sort of work within units of a week at a time. Um, I've tried to do larger, kind of like a module, but you end up with students sort of like off on time, I found. Um, and then within that week, I divide everything into um, two sections, which are to prepare and to do. So like to prepare is any sort of reading assignments or go watch this video or, you know, look up a definition of whatever. And then the to do is what would constitute kind of homeworks or activities or, or that kind of thing. And that, to me, it's all to do's, right? Like I assign you a reading, that's something you should do. But for students, I found that that division is, is helpful, that here's the work I need to do, whether it's reading or watching videos, in order to be able to complete an activity. And so right. dividing modules in that way, I found is really useful. I yeah. appreciate that because I was forced to put um, my online information into a weekly list that I despised and I but in part because it didn't have that breakout between to prepare and to do it's just one long list so um, and you know I don't like it and the students don't like it but if I could break that list down into those two yeah. major categories that's what they want to know when's this due what do I got to do when yeah, that's how I have it broken out in face-to-face -face courses, and when I have taught online, I did never change that, and, and so I, I would second that comment from Kegel. It, it works, and the more cues that you have and the, the number of places that you can cross-check it, it helps, them, helps the students stay on track. Tracy, do you want to share a great assignment? Because you're really good with assignments or exercises or activities. She's still there. Maybe. She might not be able to. Oh, she doesn't have a mic. Oh, nice. So, um, since I mentioned that I was teaching... We'll definitely take a URL. <laughs> please, yes, please paste in a URL in there, Tracy. Since I mentioned that I was teaching teachers how to teach, um, what's your one best advice for me to tell? So I'm going to say I sat with a whole group of really smart people on Friday, and this is what they told me to tell you. <laughs> so no, truly, like if you all had to give one piece of advice to brand new teachers to teach technical and professional communication, what would it be? I know that's like me, like putting y'all on the spot, like this is some sort of class, and I don't mean it to be, but I really. I'll be honest, I am struggling like a dog. Well, my uh, former chair always says, relax, nobody's going to die. It's not brain surgery. <laughs> well, it's true. <laughs> and on, on the same note as that, my uh, advisor at one point told me that you're not responsible for the literacy of every student in that class. And that made mm -hmm. me feel a lot better. You know, they just they just need to make a little bit of movement towards their own literacy is, you know, increasing in whatever it is we're teaching. Mm -hmm. Keep talking. I'm taking notes. Do you see my pen? Yeah, I'm yeah. taking notes. Um, I'm done. I'm I, done. Um, I would advise new graduate students who maybe don't have a lot of experience, certainly not professional experience with technical writing, to 
spend some time figuring out what it is on their own. Um, like, you know, uh, subscribe to listservs, um, go read a bunch of manuals, go, I don't know, just sort of immerse yourself in some way in um, functional technical writing in the world. Um, because I, I, I feel like I have seen, and I'm trying to say this in a nice way, I feel like oh, just say it. To, <laughs> it's being recorded, Mike's recording. Um, oh, that's right. I forgot. I, Never mind. <laughs> be political. Like be political. I, seen, I feel like I have seen, um, as we all know, with the pressures of course staffing, um, pedagogy that is not actually different in the ways that we were talking about earlier is important from, say, composition, right? Like I see people teaching tech com like it's advanced composition. And um, I think one way to, I think that that makes sense and that's not because anybody is, is trying to do a bad job or doesn't want to do a good job. But, you know, if, if your background is all composition and you don't have any experience professionally as a technical writer, then that's what you're comfortable with. It's sort of the like truisms of what makes good academic writing, right? And so um, I'm trying to think about ways for, to, to get people kind of immersed in the, uh, um, I mean, it's not a discourse community of, of tech com because it's, it's bigger sort of professionally, but like get them much more immersed in like the reality of technical communication. Yeah, I think, I, and, 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 and going along absolutely with that, I think that there's, you, you really want to be familiar, I mean, you really want to be familiar with, with, with the concepts that you're engaging with and how those concepts relate to very applied practical skills because yeah. students are going to yeah. think of technical communication as an applied practical skill. Um, and mm -hmm. there is a lot of, we know there, there is a lot of, of very important um, concepts and theories that can inform those skills. Um, but they really have to see the connection, and that's what the value of the activity mm -hmm. is, is to give them that hands-on experience in applying those activities and playing with those activities in a way that makes the 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 conceptual knowledge sort of explicit to them. And and a mm -hmm. lot of and, and and we've talked about the value of engagement um, with activities, but really activities are about giving them an opportunity to see that these concepts actually do have real value and, and can be toyed with and played with and applied yeah. in a very practical, meaningful way that will actually be useful to them in whatever um, career or art or whatever sort of path they are pursuing, that there really is this clear application um, within mm -hmm. it. And I think, that, I think that being able to understand that you have to make explicit this connection between concept and, and applied practical skill in order for the students to fully buy into what's going on in many cases it is absolutely fundamental and, and it really should inform mm -hmm. the activities that we're looking into. Yeah. And I, applied I just, is not a dirty word. <laughs> no, no. And my whole problem is, is that it's just so ingrained in my person and I'm having such a hard time in some ways taking steps back. And so I, we've been doing okay, but I need, I needed some, I'm so glad this was scheduled for this week. <laughs> Rick, what you, what you got for me? Well, I, you know, I'm not going to say anything new um, and it's already been said, but what I find myself talking about in the first week of, of the intro class is always the dramatic difference between the academic writing that they've done up to this point, which is to prove to the professor that they've got this knowledge in their head and they need to spit it out of their head. So it's all internal monologue to prove to the professor that they've understood the concepts, whatever those concepts may be, and then contrast that with all of the writing that they'll do outside of the academy which is, has absolutely nothing to do with the writer's capability or the writer's knowledge in terms of impressing anyone. And it is only regarded as effective if the audience member gets the information they need in the most, in the most efficient way possible. So rather than inside out, it's outside reconfigured to be outside still, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Okay. And again, that ain't anything new, but um, I 
They well, have it gives me leeway. I can say it's not just me. Look, these great smart people across the nation, this is what they said too. <laughs> right. Well, and, you know, all of these students, and again, I'm preaching to the choir, but all of these students, if this is their first class in tech writing, they've only been taught writing as a means to prove to the professor that they know mm-hmm. the whatever the material is. And they've never had to write something that had an audience that was anybody other than the professor, in a sense, mm-hmm. um, I guess is what I'm, I'm thinking yeah. of. So that's, I don't. I have a I have a I have an activity question, but let's let this sure, let's go. mechanically play out later. So so that brings that brings a, a core question, and I'm curious what sort of persona based activities um, people are engaging with. What do you mean by when to, you're using to, the word persona? Like here? audience personas? Yeah, like, like audience, audience personas. personas. Um, either oh, in you. either in 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 providing constructed personas for students mm-hmm. to pursue in class, or um, allowing students to construct their own personas. I... Through I need an answer to this so badly <laughs> because, <laughs> because so I um I was just thinking as you were talking, Rick, that um I that's such an important point to me that I make in the first week of class also. Like you are not writing for me. I am not your audience. Like, um and that activity I talked about earlier where I had students um do the list of, of types of writing and then pick what tech writing this semester worked out great as an intro for what I do every semester in an intro tech writing class, which is say, um, we are going to use three um, characteristics to talk about technical writing all semester. Technical writing is genre based, technical writing is audience focused, and technical writing is activity driven, um, where activity is kind of a stand in for um, uh, like genre is social action, right? All genres, all writing is trying to accomplish an activity of some kind. Um, so we talk about activity in terms of like motivation and goals. And often um, the first project that I'm doing this semester is an employment project. So that's been pretty um, easy for them to envision, okay, audience focus, right? Like I know who the audience is for my resume, it's the person that I want to get to hire me. And so in order, I actually have them do what I call a workplace analysis, which is essentially like a company persona, right? So I have them develop an analysis of, oh, this is the kind of place where it's a much more um, horizontal kind of workplace um, with a fun attitude. So maybe I can reflect that in my cover letter, that kind of thing. But then at the end of the semester, their big uh, assignment is a big uh, final report that they get to pick their um, some are going to do recommendation reports, some will just do kind of standard informational reports, that kind of thing. And that is always the hardest thing is the audience. I make them identify an audience that they can write um, a transmittal letter to, but inevitably I get like five people who are like, I'm writing to everybody who's interested in scuba. <laughs> I'm like, I don't, that's not a thing. Um, so I've actually been sort of racking my brain trying to think of ways in class to let them pick topics that they're interested in, but guide them to thinking about like, I don't know if I need to do some kind of stakeholder analysis. I don't know. If you all have ideas, I've thrown, thrown it, please, on your, <laughs> throwing it to your large ass. So I, I think stakeholder analyses are, 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 are useful um, in, in being able to do that. I also think that providing them, doing a, a genre analysis at some point in time in the class in which you provide them either individually or in groups um, with created personas, which can give you an opportunity to outline what you're looking for and then give them the ability to sort of um, to take on those personas and talk about what's important within the document based upon their persona get allows them to begin arguing and and drawing distinctions um, so about what matters. You've got them all working with the same document, but each one is sort of has a different persona and saying, here's how as this persona I would read mm-hmm. this document. <gasps> yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, and I and found I think, that to be a very effective exercise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, very effective. I didn't mean to cut you off, Mike. Nope. I just wanted to give you props on that's yep. a very effective <laughs> exercise. So last semester, before we started working on our instructions, I went out and I found like five stock photos mm-hmm. um, of all different kinds of people, right? And I assigned a, a product to each photo and then put the students in groups, and they had to tell me who that person or people in the stock photo was. And so we got Mm -hmm. to talk about the way that, you know, different people are using technology or would use instructions, but also 
they were creating their own persona for that person. Mm. Right. And then, and that gave me a basis to go back to when we were talking about their personas with the instruction. Right. And we see that as a class. So the first couple were kind of shaky, but by the end, they really got it and were like, had these whole elaborate um, backstories for these people. And, you know, I, I think it actually, it's one of the few exercises this semester that works pretty well. <laughs> now, that's a bang up sort of a thing. I love that. Mm -hmm. Because it gets at so many things we need the students to do. And that's a great thing that, hell, I'm doing that next week. <laughs> no, I can, I, that idea, I can shift a bit for my you know, new teachers on how to teach. And then it shows mm -hmm. them what we really mean about audience. In ways that is so much, and it circles back to your question, Mike, about how we're using and talking about audience analysis and persona use and all of that. And that is really good, Barb. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, you know they're stock photos, so they're all like these happy people. Well, yeah. <laughs> exotic locations. And, mm -hmm. so, yeah. and this is a good idea. Uh, this is really simplistic, but the. Um, the students have liked this part of the assignment. Uh, I do still teach the resume and application letter. Um, I begin the mm -hmm. intro class with that in, yeah. for lots of reasons that we all have heard about. Um, and pretty much every semester I have several students come up to me and tell me, that I got a job with this letter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, the, the part of the letter that I find most helpful in terms of understanding audiences, um, I require them to go find a real job ad for an entry level position that they would be qualified for if they were graduating or an internship. And so they have to bring that job ad to class and then they have to write their application letter for that particular job. Mm -hmm. So that requires them to do the research on the company so that they can yeah. put in that specific information that will, mm -hmm. um, you know, the specific praise for the company and show how their skills meet the company's needs. Um, and mm -hmm. again, it's simplistic, but at least it gets them thinking of whoever that company is on the other end, rather than just a generic application letter. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I do it too. And it's, even more important, I talk to them because of um, algorithmic resume sorting now, right? Where if you're if you don't have sort of the keywords from the job ad in your resume or cover letter or, or whatever uploaded stuff, if you're applying to a really big company, odds are good that they've got some algorithm running through and they're just going to kick your stuff right out if it's if it looks too generic, you know? Yeah, so I, I do the same thing in that. I'm hoping that I can do a better job this semester connecting that level of audience analysis from that project to this other like big final report. So I think I just need to keep reminding them that we did that. <laughs> Maybe. Can I ask a question about the resumes and stuff? Because it just occurred to me mm -hmm. while y'all were talking. Um, machine readable resumes and I've had a lot of students asking me, and I haven't seen the ads, a bunch of them, but, you know, they're telling us that formatting, they don't want any formatting on the resumes. Mm -hmm. There's yep. nothing worse than a resume without formatting. So how do you handle uh -huh. that? The project that I do, um, I just, I acknowledge that that's a thing, um, and that also it's a thing where they're going to write this lovely resume, and then half the jobs they apply for, they just have to hand type everything into text fields. Um, or mm -hmm. copy and paste everything into text fields. And I just kind of acknowledge that that's a reality and say, you know, that's that's just half the skills, though, producing an unformatted resume. So the thing you have to make for me is a formatted resume that could be, they turn it in electronically, but I, I tell them it, I should be able to print it out and, and be like a recruiter with a nice resume sitting at my desk if I wanted to. Um, I don't know if that really covers their needs. I, I haven't actually produced any machine, any, uh, resumes targeted towards machine readability. So I don't know if people are making different choices with those aside from just stripping 
Yeah, mostly the they're just stripped, you know, of, stripped of formatting. And, That's what I thought. And the, the key to machine readable is to ensure that you are using specific words that are in the job ad in yeah, your resume, in exactly. your cover letter, both. So the reason that I would do exactly what Kegel is saying is because they need practice mm-hmm. with document design. And, and yeah. yeah, so what? They're going to strip it all out. And so what? Mm-hmm. You better know, it may it not a hundred percent meet their needs, yeah. but they're getting a better resume, no matter if they have to copy and paste it. And they're mm-hmm. getting experience of trying to figure out how to design something to where it's readable and usable. And yeah. so that's what I would do, Carol. All right. So that, that makes me feel better because that's basically what I have done and just didn't know if I was missing something. No, uh-uh, you're not missing mm-hmm. anything. I will say one thing I, um, if I may, um, I put a call out to my engineering community. So I, I actually attended engineering college as an undergrad. Um, I was the first person ever to drop out of Olin College, if you're familiar with Olin College. Um, Mike flapping, yeah, you know Olin. Um, uh, but I'm still part of the Women's Alumni Network. And so every year when I teach, 204, teach our intro uh, engineers, I put out a call and say, hey, anybody got some good sample resumes, whatever. And I, I gather advice, and so I have several years' worth of advice from working engineers, recent grads, to people who have been out for 10 years. And recently, there's been a real shift that's been interesting to um, GitHub as a resume platform, mm-hmm. um, particularly for, like, software and programmer types. Um, oh, God, yes. Yeah. There are nerds about so, that stuff. Yeah. So and everything CS, else. Um, oh, all the CS folks here um, and the software engineers, they, um, they don't take our class. They teach their own in-house writing class. Um, so I only have like mechanical engineers, um, civil, uh, chemical, a few others. Um, so it's not really an issue for me, but I do mention it just in case students um, have an interest in applying for programming or software jobs that that's um, probably gonna be a bigger expectation is that you have a portfolio to show of work someplace like GitHub, um, and people are increasingly less concerned with, like, a formal resume or cover letter. Wow. Yep. Yeah. And everything's changing and, really quickly on those fronts. Oh, yeah. No, I was actually wowing about how cool this whole kind of process of talking about these things with other people. And mm-hmm. while I love our Twitter chats, which is how all this got started, it's just really hard some days to try to – and so just the conversing – that's what I was sitting here, just kind of like enamored, like, wow, I'm sitting in a room yeah. with really smart people and I'm enjoying it. Mm-hmm. Me so too. Lauren, you, Lauren, you said there's that movement to mm-hmm. GitHub, and um, that, but that's going to be engineering related, right? I mean, that's not across the, the and industry. computer science related, even more specifically. Yeah, 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 yeah specifically software uh, and computer science. Because I still require my students to create an online portfolio, not in GitHub, but I don't have engineering and computer science here. So I'm just making sure yeah. that I'm not missing something yeah. here. I would, You're not, I, mean, I would say that. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I, I would. I would say that 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 while for for certainly for computer scientists it's it's, in, it's important, but I mean even even if you're even if they're doing front end work. Um, mm-hmm. Being able to being able if they're even if it's even if they're just working um, with with JavaScript or basic applications along those lines, it would be it's still mm-hmm. important to be able to have the code repository uh, portfolio as mm-hmm. well as the the website itself. Okay. Yeah, and I learned this. Code, yeah, I learned this in the um, just this last week actually from a friend who is um, a two thousand. Seven engineering, 2008 engineering grad, um, and goes back and teaches a workshop at Olin College um, on employment, like a one-day uh, employment kind of workshop, is that there's also a move to um, a PDF portfolio rather than a web portfolio. So um, a lot of folks are, it's pretty standard apparently these days to produce a portfolio as a PowerPoint and then PDF it, um, or just a straight PDF and then have that because recruiters um, are asking for people to upload stuff. So you don't even have the option to put in a URL. You need to have some kind of PDF file that you can upload. So, so yeah, that's when, not, when they, that doesn't surprise me. When they create yeah. a portfolio on PowerPoint, I'm wondering mm-hmm. about the logistics of that. So, um, No, a PDF, um, a, a PDF, right? Well, no, so you yeah, can, and PowerPoint. 
So the PowerPoint well, you, option is for engineers who need visual heavy projects. Well, you can still like, do that like, in a PDF portfolio. Yeah, yeah, Could yeah. You? I'm just using PowerPoint as the design software. Oh, uh, well, yeah, software. because engineers love it, but yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <There's>... <laughs> How, did you just say yeah, PowerPoint is a design platform? Yes. Yeah. Th that's yeah. what engineers think. Yeah. I just died well, a little what, inside. I mean, <laughs> yeah, sweetie, it's okay that you died a little inside. Just have yourself a drink yeah. later and just um, – because well, I mean, that's what I, I did years so, ago. Yeah. I teach writing in the natural sciences, too, and that's mostly chemists as well as geologists and biologists. And I teach them to use PowerPoint to make posters because that's how a lot of their templates they're mm -hmm. going to be in, in departments that give them PowerPoint templates yep. for poster design. Oh, Lord, I would never try to do a poster without PowerPoint in that regard. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, and I'll, I'll, I'll go look this up online, but I'm wondering, you know, a, a more traditional portfolio where they've got some um, papers in there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm just not seeing how that fits in. I see it in a PDF. I just don't see mm -hmm. how it would go from through a PowerPoint to a PDF. But I'll figure it out. Oh, yeah, that's the issue. Because it's not a writing portfolio. It's a project portfolio. So it's like, gotcha. here's a slide that has a picture of this thing that I made with, like, a brief description on the side and the title of the project. Right. Yeah, Rick, the, the project that I did with, like, a solar car or whatever. Yeah, I think, okay. you, you know, technical like specifications, those type yeah. of things. That makes yeah. Sense. Which is, amusingly enough, another reason that GitHub is so valuable is because GitHub is actually very good at storing documentation and getting a feel mm -hmm. for how well yeah. someone documents um, the instruction related to the mm -hmm. projects they're doing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, but Rick, I yeah, I also sort of like died a little inside when I said design platform. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, you know, the only reason I tell you to have a drink is because I accepted it so many years ago. Like one of my first, <laughs> when I was still a practicing engineer, and somebody said that, and it, they were they were like trying to flow chart out and do all this like elaborate stuff in in PowerPoint. It was like, oh my god, that's really not the best tool. But all right, fine, I'll play along. <laughs> And so it was just like, damn. It, it, it's rough because engineers won't use the Word document. It's got to be in latex, but won't move mm -hmm. from PowerPoint to Illustrator. No. <laughs> but, you know, whatever. We can still teach them how to write and communicate better, and that's our jobs. And, and I, I'm, up, I'm up to the challenge. Yes. Uh, believe it or not, we've been talking an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that weird? It oh, just yeah. kind of goes. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I am so grateful that you all came. Um, I, for one, am going to leave. I've left with y'all. For one, made me feel better about this class that I'm teaching. That I, I do probably know what I'm doing. And two, <laughs> you've given me things that I can bring. And I have three new things that I'm definitely going to try. And if you all haven't looked at Tracy's trip assignment that she put the URL in the trap, the the chat, you should probably look at it because it's really cool. Uh, so thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to continue to do these. So tell your friends and pop in anytime. You don't even have to stay the full hour. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So any any closing organizing. comments from anybody? Just thank you for We're setting up the you. WebEx mic. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I will figure out what this recording looks like, and um, <laughs> we'll see how we can make it public. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Uh, bye, Carol. Bye bye. Bye, bye everybody. Barb, it was Thanks so much. great to see you. Good to see you, too. I have some questions I need to ask you, but I can't remember what they are, of course. So. Uh, do you want me to call you one day or email you one day next week? Only if I can remember them. <laughs> okay. Well, you know how to find me. I was just going to help you out by, like, taking the onus and it, putting it on my to-do <laughs> list. But I'm not hard no. to find, honey. And for you, no, anything. I will, I will call or email you. So. Okay. Okay. I'm always Good around for you. you. Bye, nice honey. To meet the rest of you. Bye. Bye -bye. Good meeting you. Bye. Uh, Mike, let me know if you need me to help you with something. I absolutely will. I've turned the recorder off now, so we're no longer recording, I don't think. I don't know. Oh, and Rick, it was great to see you too in yeah. your fancy sweater. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Thank you very much, Mike and Lisa, for setting this up. I appreciate it.